Welcome to the National Gallery and to this lecture about the Monet and Architecture exhibition, Reviewed. It's a great pleasure and a privilege to have been the guest curator for Monet and Architecture, and it's been a delight to work with the very impressive team here at the National Gallery, and particularly with my old friend Chris Riopel, the curator of 19th century painting, who's played such a major part in this. The exhibition has been a huge success with the public and with the press over the last three months, and as it draws to a close, it's a pleasure for me to reflect on what the exhibition has meant to me, other curators and scholars, and also, of course, the general public. It's a great excitement for somebody in my position who came up with a concept and made the selection to actually see the works coming together in the exhibition. Here is an image of the last room in the exhibition, the paintings made by Monet in Venice in 1908, which he finally exhibited in 1912. This brings the exhibition to a close because this was the last time Monet had an exhibition in which buildings played a substantial part in his paintings. Here in the final room, we see two people looking at a couple of paintings of the Doge's Palace, and on the other side, two others looking at two paintings of Santa Maria della Salute. Monet in Venice makes a splendid finale, and we have nine paintings of Venice in the exhibition, which is about a quarter of the pictures that he painted when he was there. What is particularly gratifying about this image is that the viewers, the visitors to the exhibition, are making comparisons. They are looking carefully at the pictures. They're responding, for example, to the Doge's Palace pictures and looking at the slight change in light effects that we get in the two paintings. And that is exactly the sort of thing that one wants people to do, to look closely. To discuss the hang of the exhibition is, I think, of interest. When the works arrive in the exhibition and are unpacked, taken out of their cases, they take on a real identity which they, don't ha they haven't had before because one hasn't seen them in this context and with the pictures that one had hoped to hang them with. Here on the left, we see three pictures of uh, the cliff at Vahongeville with the church on the top, painted in 1882. One might have thought of hanging the pictures on the left and on the right there together because they're painted from more or less the same viewpoint and so show the old medieval church of saint Valéry on the top of the cliffs from a very, very similar but not exactly identical viewpoint. And yet the painting of the church seen from the beach with the great cliff forming a wall in front absolutely insisted on being the centerpiece. And so that is the way we hung that uh, picture, that, that group of pictures. And on the right, we see another trio of paintings, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. But here you can see another sequence that I particularly wanted, which don't obviously form a trio because the subjects are different, two are the same and one's different. But again, this is something that one put together to try and make the public, the visitor, think. What is happening here? Why are these together? And I'll come back to these in a moment. The Monet and Architecture exhibition was strongly supported by private collectors, to whom we are extremely grateful. There are something like 80 paintings in the exhibition, and about a quarter of them have come from private collections. And here is just a cross-section of half a dozen of those. It's been a great advantage to this exhibition that it's in the National Gallery, a very, very prestigious museum, uh, and that the exhibition has been just here at a single venue. And I think both those things have encouraged private collectors to be so generous. And just this cross-section of pictures from private collections shows something of the aim of the Monet and Architecture exhibition. The idea was to try and make people look at Monet differently to look at how buildings, man-made constructions in his paintings, actually counted for different things in his work. Monet was primarily, primarily a painter. His decisions were fundamentally pictorial. For example, he used buildings as regular shapes in the irregularity of nature, as you can see in the 
cliff at Varangeville at the top right, where you get the angled roof of the little customs officer's cabin amongst the ragged edges of the cliffs. He also used buildings for chromatic purposes, adding an accent of colour. So there, the, in, in the same picture, you get the warm colour of the roof set against the cooler colours of the grass on the clifftop. Sometimes Monet used buildings to act as screens on which light played. And there you see that in this a picture like the absolutely splendid example of his Rouen Cathedral series that we have in the centre. The little picture at the top of the staircase, L'Escalier, is an exceptional picture because Monet only painted a handful, a tiny handful of pictures where the viewpoint that he took is actually surrounded by buildings, as you get here. So that was a particularly exciting painting to get. But buildings suggested all sorts of other things to him. Buildings suggested modernity. And so the picture at the top left uh, shows modern villas built in the suburbs of Paris. But also Monet was a tourist. Modernity at the end of the 19th century, the spread of railways, the development of travel guides and so on, encouraged people to visit cities like Rouen and Venice to see the great architecture of the cathedrals and churches and palazzi. And so the exhibition pulls people's attention widely towards different purposes that Monet used his paint, uh, buildings in his paintings for. And we had the opportunity to see new conjunctions of pictures. So, for example, here on the left is a painting I know very well, the picture of the church at, Va uh, at Veteuil from the National Gallery of Scotland. And with great good fortune, we were able to borrow this other painting on the right-hand side, a slightly larger painting, painted from more or less the same viewpoint, but at a slightly different date. Monet arrived in, in, in Veteuil in September 1878, and the picture on the right must have been painted <coughs> excuse me, shortly after his arrival because the trees are still in summer leaf. And the Edinburgh picture has slightly brown trees, still foliated, and that suggests slightly later in the year. So perhaps on the right, September, and on the left, October or even early November. And here are these paintings of the church, uh, a very famous um, medieval building with a, a late Renaissance facade, is set in the context of the very ordinary village, Monet the naturalist. Monet not prepared to elaborate or decorate things, but painting things as they were. Another aspect of an exhibition is that it brings together pictures that aren't seen together and they teach one things. Even someone who's an expert in the field or has worked in a field for a long time can see new things. For example, in these two pictures of Bordighera, uh, the Italian coastal town he visited in 1884, one can see at the bottom right of the right-hand picture and the center right margin of the left-hand picture, one can see how he used a lavender green uh, combination to give a sense of dense, of fo dense foliage that doesn't have much definition. And one's seeing Monet coming up with shortcuts, coming up with little tricks that'll help him in one campaign of painting. And that sort of discovery is a great surprise. I mentioned that I would come back to these pictures, the two painted at Trouville in the summer of 1870, and then one painted in London just a few months later. And putting these pictures together interested me particularly because although the subjects are different, the compositions are very similar. In the Trouville pictures, he used the boardwalk leading into the uh, space um, as a perspectival device, which he didn't clutter up near to the spectator, but did deeper in. So the eye is drawn up that perspective at some speed into the picture before it sees anything of interest. And that's a device that he used in the picture of the Houses of Parliament on the right-hand side just a few months later. And interestingly, Trouville had only been developed as a seaside resort over the last 20 years. And when Monet painted the Thames at Westminster there in 1871, the Thames Embankment, the Victoria Embankment, and the Houses of Parliament had only just been completed. So he was painting something that was, again, a very new, modern environment. 
using a modern, thrusting, speedy composition for these modern compositions. And one comes up also with some very unusual combinations. Monet painted about 35 paintings when he was in London around 1900 from the Savoy Hotel looking towards Charing Cross Bridge. And of those over 30 paintings, only two of them show Cleopatra's needle, which was immediately underneath his balcony at the hotel. And neither of those paintings which show Cleopatra's needle were completed. He edited out the needle and the embankment at the bottom right. And it's absolutely marvellous that, that in this exhibition we've been able to have one of these unfinished pictures with Cleopatra's needle and two of the finished paintings without it that show the variations that Monet brought about. And clearly he didn't want that emphatic vertical in the foreground. He was fascinated by the play of light on the surface of the Thames as he looked southwards in the late morning and afternoon. Uh, and that is, that is what he painted in these finished pictures. Of course, some paintings got away. The exhibition opens with this picture on the left of the Lutenance at Honfleur, painted in 1864, and it would have been marvellous to have had its other version on the right-hand side. Because 1864 was when Monet was 23, he was a young man, this was the very beginning of his career. And it's interesting that he, he started painting architecture, important buildings like the picturesque, old Lutenons at Honfleur right at the beginning of his career in a pair of pictures showing slightly different light effects. Um, we might also have got a couple of Amsterdam paintings that we missed, which he painted in the mid-1870s when he visited that city. And I put these two pictures in with images from a contemporary guidebook written by a man that Monet actually knew, because again there was a question of should we include in the exhibition material like guidebooks, which Monet certainly consulted, or railway posters, which he would have known, that set the context for the exhibition. And we decided not to, that that would clutter the exhibition and we would rely exclusively on Monet's paintings. I think that was the right decision, given the intensity with which people have looked at the pictures. And of course, the beautifully designed catalogue has all the comparative material, such as images from guidebooks and railway posters, uh, that are needed to explain Monet uh, more thoroughly. Another trio of pictures I would like to have put together is this one. We have the two paintings on the left, obviously the wonderful painting of the Japanese bridge from the National Gallery, and the painting from Vet Vetoi on the, in the centre. It was a shame we weren't able to get the picture on the right-hand side, because I wanted to have a triptych of these more or less square and more or less symmetrical paintings that Monet painted around 1900. And to have had the picture of the Grande Allée on the right-hand side with the garden path going straight up the centre towards Monet's house um, would have made a wonderful pair with the National Gallery's own Japanese bridge with that symmetry giving a wonderfully harmonious and calm quality to these paintings made at a difficult and rather sad time in Monet's life. <clears throat> Sometimes uh, pictures are difficult to get um, because of other exhibitions and right at the beginning of the modernity section we were not able to get this picture of saint germain lauxois the great church in central Paris. But we were very fortunate to, to get this painting of the Quai du Louvre uh, from The Hague, um, which is a splendid painting, so animated in the way it gives the movement of modern Paris in the foreground, and then sets that against the stillness of the monuments of the city in the background, the medieval church of saint etienne du mont the 18th century dome of the Pantheon, and to the right, the smaller dome of the 17th century Val de Grasse. There's one final absence that I'd like to admit to, uh, and that is this picture on the right. We are extremely lucky that the Musée d'Orsay lent us the Rue Montorgueil, this wonderful painting from 1878, showing the French public celebrating the success of the Exposition Universelle that year. A painting of modernity and flourish, 
a painting that shows tremendous energy as the population of Paris celebrated their national success. When Monet was back in London uh, at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, in 1901, he painted a view from Leicester Square looking westwards. In fact, he painted this motif three times. And to have had a similar view from a high window looking down on the city here at night with this perspectival view up the street hidden would have made a wonderful dramatic contrast. But unfortunately, we were not able to borrow that picture. I'm particularly pleased that the public has enjoyed the exhibition. It's had a splendid response on social media. I will never look at his work the same way again. That is exactly the sort of thing one wants to hear. And also somebody said it was utterly beguiling. Monet is indeed a beguiling painter. But the idea that one has drawn people into looking at Monet's work in a different way is something that's very gratifying. And there were a number of comments about how the exhibition is a master class. And that suggests that the curator's role is to lay the works of art out in a way that is suggestive and inspiring and encourages the viewer to look freshly and closely. And that's what we can see in this installation photograph here. Uh, the woman on the left-hand side is looking very attentively at that picture of the Doge's palace, looking, no doubt, at the brushwork and the colour at the bottom of the canvas. And in the centre, you can see a lady who is holding out a little booklet. And it was a very, very clever idea of the National Galleries not to have wall labels down by the canvases, by the frames, but to have all the information about the pictures in a little booklet. And watching people go round the exhibition, I think one can see that people have been greatly um, inspired by that because they can stand back from the picture, read what it, what it says in the little booklet, and then look at the painting again, as this lady is doing in the centre there. And that, I think, has been a very good innovation. Finally, I would show a slide here of the teacher's session that we had in June. And it shows in the background, as it happens, the wonderful sequence of five paintings of Rouen Cathedral that we had, pictures that Monet showed as a series in 1895. And to be able to show five of the 20 that he exhibited in that year altogether is, is something that we are very thrilled about. But I think it's important here that the spectators, the visitors, are teachers. These are people who are going to go into schools and they're going to encourage their pupils to look closely at pictures to enjoy going to exhibitions, but to be an active participant in the experience of looking. And I think that is, above all, something of great importance. If Monet and architecture has succeeded at all as an exhibition, and the visitor numbers and responses we've had suggest it has, then it's because Monet is a beautiful and varied painter. His long career gives an extraordinary diversity of subjects and handling. And these pictures give a great sense of joy. But above all, that encourages people to look closely. And that is what this exhibition has done. Thank you very much.